Now this, the analogy of that has to do with carpet cleaning. I remember when uh, Ed Dodson came and cleaned the carpet at 201. <coughs> and the carpet there at 201 was kind of a sandy pink color, kind of a mauve pink color. And we chose that because it didn't show dirt quite as noticeably, which is wise. But uh, I was amazed. Even though we would vacuum it regularly, when he put the steam cleaning on the carpet, uh, you know, steam cleaning is, is water and heat. Now, this is an interesting metaphor, isn't it? Because the word, God compares his word with water. But the heat comes from life. It comes from the world and the flesh and the devil. And that's what is used to do deep cleaning of a carpet. It's steam, heated water. And he showed me the, uh, the hose that was pulling the stuff out of the carpet and draining it out into the parking lot. And it was this dark gray color. And I was thinking, well, it doesn't look that way when you look at the carpet. So how, how can all of this be? Well, you know, it's ground-in dirt that's been walked on for years and years, and it's oils from food and from stuff that you step on and that you bring in there, and the fibers deteriorate over time, and the glue that was holding the fibers, it, it gets old and it starts, you know, breaking apart. And all of that then becomes very very ugly when it all gets pulled out. And I was thinking about life, I was thinking about my life, but really all of our lives, and how just like choosing a color that doesn't show dirt, how that, that's a wise thing, and there's no reason to put uh, you know a white carpet out there wherever a little speck of everything gets, gets shown. But on the other hand, I'm reminded of what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He said, well, you know, outside you appear to be righteous, but inside you're, you're full of all kinds of uncleanness. Now, look, I'm not saying that we're all Pharisees. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, they were a bunch of narcissistic, bloodthirsty uh, people that, that were evil. But we, we do need to recognize that there are things in us that are not visible to outsiders that are still in us that need to be cleansed. Right. And that the blood of Jesus was given to cleanse that stuff too. Just as much as the vacuum cleaner was given to cleanse all of our big obvious sinfulness that we had when we came to Jesus. And so that's what I mean by deep cleaning. Now, it's interesting, since this is Christmas time, it's interesting to note that three of the four Gospels do not begin with the story of Jesus' birth. They begin with John the Baptist. Now that's interesting because what did John the Baptist do? He baptized. Duh! Well, what is that? It was a cleansing. It was, it was a metaphor to demonstrate what God wanted to do or wants to do with humanity. Okay? Um, turn in Mark. Mark chapter 1. The first verse says, The beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is telling us that the gospel of Jesus Christ begins with what John the Baptist came to do and to proclaim. Even though Jesus had not enacted the new covenant 
yet, <clears throat> at the time John was baptizing, his coming to announce that the Messiah was coming and to tell the people of Israel to get ready was, is, according to what it says, part of the gospel. The good news. The beginning of the good news. And he goes on to say, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will make ready your way. And the you is prophesy, Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus Christ. And we can read that and say, okay, yeah, he prophesied. Jesus was prophesied by Isaiah. And now John the Baptist comes. And he prophesies that Jesus is coming. And Jesus is coming real soon. Not just 700 years later like Isaiah did. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the aspect of foretelling. It was the aspect of preparing. The point here is salvation in all of its possible iterations, whether you're talking about getting born again, or you're talking about getting healed, or you're talking about getting the curses taken out of your life, or being protected from everything the devil would like to do to you, that's all, that is all salvation. Salvation is not just getting saved and going to heaven. Salvation requires preparation. Think back of your own life before you got born again. You probably heard of Jesus. You know, you might have gone to church all the time. You might have heard Billy Graham talk on TV. And Christianity was way more part of public life back then when most of us were growing up than it is now. <clears throat> but even now, you still hear talk about it. There was a guy on uh, Meet the Press this morning on Channel 5 that was very openly talking about Jesus Christ. And I think they were wanting to take that somewhere else maybe than what we would do with it. They were wanting to, to make a political statement because the, the man was the son of a preacher and he was talking about how there was something wrong in the church when the church is getting all wrapped up in politics. This stuff what Steve and I say all the time. This guy was saying on TV. It's like, yay! But here's my point. Just hearing about Jesus is not going to save you until your heart is prepared to receive it. It's the same thing with receiving the Holy Spirit or receiving healing or anything from God. You've got to get prepared or you're not going to receive it. Okay, so John the Baptist came to prepare Israel <clears throat> for receiving their Messiah. Now, in verse 3, it goes on to say that John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness, shouting, quote, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his beaten tracks straight, level, and passable. Now, oddly enough, the word prepare in verse 2 is not the same Greek word as the word prepare in verse 3. Now, verse 2, Isaiah was prophesying what God had tasked Jesus with coming to do. Verse 3 is John the Baptist telling Israel and telling us what we need to do. That's, that's one fact. Another thing, the word prepare in verse 2 is a more immediate thing. It's a more instantaneous thing. There was an appointed time when Jesus came. He, there was a specific time that Jesus came, just like there's going to be a specific time when He comes again. Okay, God doesn't just do things randomly. I'll, you know, spin the wheel and okay, well, it'll be Tuesday the 31st of March or something, you know. No. And, but, and also, 
According to Strong's Concordance, I'm getting this out of Strong's Concordance, okay, so if I'm not right, you can blame Dr. Strong on that. But he says that the word prepare in number verse 2 has to do more with an external thing, with the visible preparation to build something. So Jesus came visibly. He was God in visible form. But the prepare in verse 3 is more of an internal thing. We can say it this way. If we look at our own salvation, when we came to Jesus, when we accepted Him as our Savior, we made some lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that was external. But then, for many, many decades after that, He's still working on the internal. That's the deep cleaning that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the baptism that John came to bring to Israel was about the deep cleaning. It wasn't just about a ritual. And see, this is where a lot of a lot of Christians seem to like rituals. They seem to think, well, I've done this. I've checked that box. You know, I got born again on such and such a day, and I received the Holy Spirit on such and such a day. So check that box. Now I can go on with my life. Well, you going on with your life, there's still some stuff in there that when the when the steam clean starts working on it, it's going to come out looking dark gray. Right? Not just the Pharisees. Okay, but then verse 4. It says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. Well, we know about the wilderness from Revelation chapter 12. That's a place set apart. You come out of Babylon to go to the wilderness. Well, they came out of Jerusalem, metaphorically, of the uh, religious system of Judaism. Even the Pharisees and Sadducees, it said, came out to hear him. And, and he said, well, what are you guys doing out here? But the wilderness represents... I mean, it can be a specific place. In, in the case of John the Baptist, it was by the Jordan River, which was, you know, it would be a, a long walk from Jerusalem to get down there. But it's not just a physical place. But it is <clears throat> where we go to encounter God, where we go to hear His message, where we go to obey His commands. Which implies that we are in an attitude or relationship of submission and obedience to Him. You know, people ask, well, where is the wilderness and how will I know where I'm supposed to go when it's time to flee? And the first prerequisite is, well, first of all, you better be in submission to God and you better be in the habit of obeying what He tells you to do. Or you're going to miss it. Or you may not even hear it to begin with because you'll be so wrapped up in the cares of this world or something. Alright. <clears throat> John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism obligating repentance. Well see, this the deep cleaning that we're talking about, it requires change. See, repentance, the word metanoia in Greek, means a change of your mind. In fact, the Amplified even describes it this way. It says, a change of one's mind for the better, heartily amending one's ways with abhorrence of their past sins in order to obtain forgiveness and release from those sins. And see, to be baptized, baptizo, the Greek word baptized, doesn't necessarily always refer to water. In the case of John the Baptist, it did. But, I'll go take you another place. Go to Matthew chapter 3, where Matthew talks about the ministry of John the Baptist. 
John and John the Baptist points out that there are two other baptizos that God intends for His people. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John says, I indeed baptize you in water because of repentance, but he who is coming after me, and he's referring to Jesus of course, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy or fit to take off. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Of course, the, whole, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was what was poured out at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And it didn't go away with the intervening years. It's still available today. And most of you experienced that. But, what is this baptism of fire? Here would be, thus saith the ray on that one, okay? I mean, there's a lot of implications to that. But the way I would summarize the baptism of fire is spiritual warfare. You know, it says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that come upon you to test you. Okay, you, those trials are going to happen in this world. Jesus said, I didn't pray God for you to take them out of the world, but for you to keep them from the evil that's in the world. Well, your baptism of fire then is you contending with that evil to keep it from getting in you and controlling your life. That's a baptism of fire. And each person's fire looks a little different. You know, some people, it's a bonfire in their backyard. Some people, it's a, a fireplace. Some, some people, it's a dearborn heater. Whatever. But it's a fire. It'll burn. <coughs> uh, there's more that could be said about that. But let me keep reading here. His, referring to Jesus, winnowing fan Excuse me, is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clean out, clear out and clean his threshing floor. And he will gather and store his wheat in his barn. But the chaff he will burn up with fire that cannot be put out. Well, a winnowing fan, according to Strong's Concordance, simply would be any kind of instrument that uh, strains things out or sorts things out. Uh, if you're working in the kitchen and you're <laughs> sifting flour or something, it could be a sieve of some kind. Uh, a colander. Something that... that um, separates the fine particles from the not so fine particles. You know, I was squeezing limes last night for going to make a key lime pie. <laughs> and after you squeeze the lime, you get a lot of the, the pulpy stuff in there too. Well, if, you, if it really has to be just pure lime juice, which well, she told me it did. She said, it's okay to put the pulp in the pie. That, I mean, yeah, okay. Good. But if I wanted it to be pure, pure, then I would have to run it through a sieve. Right? I have to run it through a strainer. Well, that's what he says. A winnowing fan is in Jesus' hand. He wants us pure, not just saved. And he, he pours us, he pours our life via his word through a strainer to get out the impurities. And it says that he will thoroughly clean 
his threshing floor. We'll talk about the threshing floor in a minute because there's a lot of spiritual symbolism of that. <clears throat> but first, let's talk about the, the cleaning that Jesus does. Go keep the place here in Matthew 3. Go to John chapter 15. Thoroughly cleaning. The word thorough really means through and through. Just like the carpet cleaning, it's not just the surface vacuuming. It's getting down to the, the bottom of the thing. And sometimes in our lives, some of the things that need to be cleaned out, we have clung to. That for whatever reason, maybe it's in our upbringing, it's in our culture, um, it's a preconceived idea, I don't know. It can be anything for anybody, I guess. But sometimes it's in your system, so to speak. And thorough cleaning would be to get something out of your system. Okay, that would be implied in the word thorough cleaning. John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, He cuts away, trims off, or takes it away. And He cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more richer and more excellent fruit. So, just being cleansed, just being pruned, doesn't mean you're a bad Christian or a bad person. In fact, as we will see, it really means that God has a purpose for you and He wants you to be clean. He doesn't want anything in your life that's unproductive. Okay, in verse 3 it says, You are cleansed and pruned already because of the Word which I have given you. The Word that you have received. Dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding, vitally united in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Well, fruit, the church traditionally has defined fruit only as numbers of people. That if something is fruitful, then it's well populated. And a lot of things can be well populated that are not necessarily the fruit of God. Steve was talking about the number of people that watched his nephew's video. This is no slam against his nephew. I'm not, I'm not saying this to criticize him. But the video was not about God at all. It was just him slipping and sliding on eyes. And there were three million people watched that. And Steve taught a wonderful teaching last week uh, about, you know, getting, getting where God wants us to be. And 69 people watched that. And 54 of them were not even from uh, America. So... Numbers is not what fruitfulness is about. I mean, that is such a limited way to describe bearing fruit. You know, I grow peppers in my backyard. And there's one little pepper plant. I guess I call it an ornamental pepper plant. Because those little red things are so tiny, I couldn't eat them if I wanted to. 
about, about the best I could do if I really wanted to was pick them off. And that would be such a chore in itself. Pick them all off and put them in a jar of vinegar and maybe six months from now it'd be some hot sauce of some kind. Okay, but I'm not going to do that. But that plant is just full of those little tiny red bumps on that plant. But the, the big nice jalapenos that I like to, to eat and make hot sauce with, it just it didn't produce a whole lot of those. It produced it is still producing, praise God. But that's the fruit I'm looking for. I don't care if that little ornamental pepper plant puts out a thousand of those little red bumps. I don't I don't need those. So the fruit God's looking for is His nature and His character coming up out in our lives. One of the ways to describe that, of course, in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit which His work within us produces. Okay. But back to this pruning thing that it talked about in verse 3. I see that happening at three different levels. There's pruning at the level of us as individual people. There's pruning within the body of Christ. And then there's pruning of whole nations, whole populations, whole cultures. Let's look at each one of those individually. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Pruning us, Jesus said there in John 15, 3, is accomplished with His Word. Most people will say, well, it's the circumstances of life that, that you know, if this bad thing hadn't happened to me, then I wouldn't have turned to Jesus. Well, bad things happen to people all the time, and they don't all turn to Jesus. So what is the difference? It's well when the bad thing happened and the Word was presented to you and you latched on to that. That's how that bad thing brought you to Jesus. It was because of the Word and not because of the bad thing. Okay? And it says it this way in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. It says, Have you completely forgotten the divine word of appeal and encouragement in which you are reasoned with and addressed as sons. God is calling us His sons and He says, My son, do not think lightly or scorn to submit to the correction and discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage or give up or faint when you are reproved or corrected by Him. What corrects us? Is it the circumstance? Not necessarily. Some people just become more hardened in their sin by that circumstance. What corrects us is His Word. So, so in a troublesome situation and the Word comes to you, don't reject that Word. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom He loves. He punishes, even scourges every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. You must submit to and endure the correction for discipline. For God is dealing with you as sons. It's his word. Now, that can apply to more than just each one of us as an individual person. Keep the place here in Hebrews also. And go to Isaiah chapter 40. You see, there is a cleansing, I believe, going on in the body of Christ as a whole right now. <coughs> and Pat, you were talking about those that were saying that <coughs> 2024 is going to be 24K. Well, it will be 24K when we are cleansed and we are shining. It's not going to be 24K because 
everything's going to be rosy and everything's going to be lovely. Yeah. And we're going to have all of our goodies the way we want it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 4, there's four. Four. Isaiah chapter 4. <laughs> Verse 4. <clears throat> you know, over there in <clears throat> Hebrews, we were reading about how He cleanses us. Well, here, He's talking about the cleansing continuing. <laughs> And the cleansing is not just happening to isolated individuals. It says, after the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and the Amplified gives some suggestions of what that filth might be. It might be pride, vanity, haughtiness. See, there's a lot of things that people think are filthy that are filthy but there's things that God says are filthy that people sometimes don't think are all that filthy and being high minded and proud and thinking you're you're exceptional you know you you deserve the best and selfishness that that's filthy as far as God's concerned and it says that God is going, there's a process He is involved in getting rid of that in the body of Christ. I'm t I know I'm talking to the body of Christ now. So what I'm telling you is, if you got that in you, God's going to get it out if you stay in the body of Christ. And if you don't want it gotten out, then probably that means you're going to get out of the body of Christ. But if you stay in the body of Christ, God's going to get that stuff out. So you've got a decision to make. Do you want to cling to your old way of life? Or do you want anything that's unclean in your old way of life removed from you? If you do, stay in the body of Christ because He says He's going to get it out of you. And it says it will be purged. He will purge the blood stains of Jerusalem. Now, this is Old Testament prophecy, okay? But it didn't just get fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. It's God's whole plan for humanity. And the daughters of Zion are the ones that stay in the boat for it to happen. The rest of them don't. When He has purged the bloodstains of Jerusalem from the midst of it by the spirit and blast of judgment and by the spirit and blast of burning and sifting. Well, you know, Isaiah said over there in another place, it's when the judgments are in the earth that people are going to learn righteousness. That in, in the land of plenty, they don't learn it. Now, the judgment, God doesn't have to, okay, where's the, where's the judgment button? No, oh, it's over here. Bang. No, He doesn't have to do that. The judgment is in the system. You know, the judgment, the system's judging us all the time. And to, for God to, uh, to be uh, in charge of that and in control means He knows when to turn that thing off. But if it's happening, we as God's people can deal with it. And we must deal with it. Just like, okay. The spirit and blast of judgment, burning and sifting. Then the Lord will create over the whole site and over all dwelling places of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the, the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory shall be a canopy, a defense of divine love and protection. Well, we, as the daughter of Zion, are looking forward to that, aren't we? Yes. Well, then stay put for the burning and sifting. It's like you've got to go through that to get to that other. 
Okay, but this doesn't just happen for the body of Christ. This happens for whole nations, whole cultures. Keep the place here in Isaiah. Go to Daniel chapter 7. There is an error. Steve and I talk about this all the time, so I'm not going to take a lot of time laying this all out for you. That's what the guy on Meet the Press on Channel 5 this morning was talking about, about how wrong it is that the church of Jesus Christ has conflated God with country. That they have conflated, they have mixed, mingled commitment to, to Jesus Christ with patriotism. Mm -hmm. That like those two things are one and the same, and they're not. Not that patriotism is a bad thing per se, but you must not say, well, that's part and parcel of your uh, Christianity. It might, in some cases it might be, but in some cases it isn't. And here in Daniel is one of the places where I think we can see the future for America, I think. Now, it doesn't mention America in here, so we would have to, by inference, assume that we're talking about America. But see, here's another problem with the church. The church tends to see itself as Israel. And, okay, there, there's some validity in the idea that the promises that God made in the Old Testament apply to the, the New Testament believers. Okay. And there is a sense that, well, <clears throat> before Jesus came, uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were a special people. And now we as born-again Christians, it says we're a holy nation, a special people. But that holy nation doesn't mean we American Christians. It means us born-again people. Okay, so th that word nation in that context is not referring to geopolitical entities in the world system. Okay, it's referring to a culture, referring to a people. So for the church to think that the nation, the state of Israel in the, the Middle East and the state or country of the United States that we are joined at the hip and that we are under <coughs> the same covenant with God. And they'll say, well, it's because of what the Puritans did back in the 1600s. Well, they may have thought that. But is America today in its current state Israel in any sense of the word? No. Okay, but then, on the other hand, there are those in the end time prophecy ministry like Steve and I are that see America the way that it is now and say well it's just going to hell in a handbasket so it is America is Babylon Babylon is bigger than America in fact what makes America Babylon is not geographically centered in the United States of America. It's all over the world. It's in Thailand. It's in London. It's in South Africa. It's, it's in Venezuela. It, it, it's, it's a spiritual worldwide force. So I would say it's not biblically accurate for the church to look at what the Bible says about Israel and try to apply that to America. Nor is it perfectly accurate to see what the Bible says about Babylon the harlot and say, well, that uniquely applies to America. Okay, it applies to America. Just as I say, the promises to Israel can apply to the church in America. But America is America. There is, Israel. There is Babylon. And you get to choose which one of those you're going to be. And I see some encouragement here in Daniel 7. Let me read it. 
In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions in his head. But he was lying down on his bed, and then he wrote down the dream and the gist of the matter. Now that tells us something right there. The gist of the matter transcends the specific details. The gist of the matter is like, what's the point? Okay, what's the point of us teaching end time prophecy? That's what we're talking about today is to get ready. Right? Okay, so that's the gist of the matter. And Daniel said, Well, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven, which is political and social agitations, were stirring up the great sea, the nations of the world. And four great beasts came up out of the sea in succession, and each different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Stephen and I have talked about this, how the emblem on the British flag is a lion with eagle's wings. They call it a griffin. And, you know, this country was originally, I mean, other than the Native Americans who, you know, they all had their hunting territories and stuff, but the Europeans that colonized this continent basically were the British when they came and made it a colony before the Revolutionary War in 1776. So we are an, out, we are an outgrowth of Britain. A lion with eagle's wings. And some of the wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet of a man and a man's heart was given to it. <clears throat> the plucking of the wings is the deep cleaning of America. You know, we look at, we Christians look at America and say, well, there's so much sin and degradation going on here. What's it going to take to get us back to God? And those out there say, well, get Donald Trump elected president again. No. What it's going to take is for our wings to get plucked. But then it says we will be raised up on our feet and given the heart of a man, the man Jesus Christ. So for that to happen, America is going to look different than what it has looked like during our lifetime. But that's a good thing. Just like cleaning that carpet at 201, getting that gray stuff out of the fibers of the carpet. That's a good thing. You just let it sit there. It's just going to get grodier and grodier. And over time, you're just going to have to yank the whole thing out. See, we don't want that to happen to America. We don't want the whole thing to be nuked and raised to the ground. Some people say, well, that's what's going to happen. No, this says... The wings are going to get plucked, but then it's going to be raised up on its feet and given the heart of a man. And that's what I'm believing. That I, I, will, I will prophesy that that's what is going to happen to the United States of America. Okay, back to Matthew chapter 3. Verse 12, he says, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will clear out and clean his threshing floor and gather the wheat to his barn. Well, most of the church at least the evangelical church, believe is looking forward to a rapture, which would be the gathering to the barn. You know, when we all get to heaven, what a great rejoicing it will be, and all of that, right? Well, okay, it, it's there in the scripture, and that will happen, but let's see what Jesus says about that. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Verse 37. Jesus said, He who sows good seed 
is the Son of Man. That's who he refers to himself as, Jesus, the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed means the children of the kingdom. The tares, the darnel, is the children of the evil one. The enemy who sowed the darnel is the devil. The harvest is the close and consummation of the age. The reapers are angels. And just as the darnel weeds, which resemble wheat, are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of offense and all who do iniquity and act wickedly. And He will cast them into a furnace of fire, and there will be weeping and wailing and grinding of teeth. Now, I would speculate that that gathering out of the kingdom those things that cause offense is not done without the cooperation and approval of those who are get, who are being gathered out. You know, just like I don't believe God is going to pick you up by the nap of your neck and throw you to the wilderness where you're going to be fed and kept safe. You will have chosen that. But the Holy Spirit is, is prompting that and He's making the way before us. He has been and is continuing to do so. Well, likewise, for those who are going to end up in the great tribulation, the angels, and by the way, angels aren't always God's angels. You know that. There's good angels and bad angels. Okay? The bad angels are making the way for those who aren't going to be the weak, those who have clung to the dirt that's in their fiber and they don't want to let that go. He's making a way for them to to not come out and to to be gathered away from those who want to be taken out. There is a separation going on in the body of Christ. But it, again, I'm saying it's not it's not you're going to be dragged kicking and screaming one place or the other. No, you will self-select really which way you're going. But the way is being uh, forged before you by supernatural beings. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, verse 42. He will gather them into a furnace of fire. This is the great tribulation, the wrath of God <clears throat> for 40 days. And there will be weeping and wailing and grinding of teeth. But then will the righteous shine. And those in right standing with God will shine like the sun of the king, sun in the kingdom of their father. And let him who has ears to hear be listening. Let him consider, perceive, and understand by hearing. Well, that's our job right there. Now, it talks about the chaff being burned up. Well, Malachi talks about that too. Go to Malachi. Back up a few pages to Malachi chapter 4. It says, verse 1, For behold, the day comes that shall burn like an oven, and all the proud and arrogant. You see, it's not just all the pedophiles and all the homosexuals and all the, you know, Democrats. It says the proud and the arrogant. And those who do wickedly and are lawless shall be stubble. They'll be chaff. That's what chaff is, is stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. And it further describes this over in Malachi chapter 3. Behold, verse 1, I send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Isn't this interesting? This is what John the Baptist did the first time. Well, he coming, Jesus is coming back a second time. 
and it, this will apply the second time as well as it did the first time. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek. There's something else that's mandatory. We must be seeking him. Whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And we are the temple. Each one of you, individually and collectively. We're his temple. The messenger or angel of the covenant, whom you desire, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the priests, the sons of Levi. The priests, according to the order of Melchizedek, as Steve talked about. He will refine them like gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then will the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the ancient years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, against those who oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the who oppress the widow and the fatherless, and who turn aside the temporary resident from his right, and fear not me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord. I do not change, and that's why you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. <clears throat> well, the fire does its job. It cleanses us. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You don't have to go looking for trials. The trials will find you. I remember a line from a song by Joni Mitchell back in the day. She says, just when you think you finally got it made, bad news comes knocking at your garden gate, knocking for you. Well, everybody's bad news might not be the same as somebody else's bad news. But what are you going to do when it comes? Are you going to lose your faith? Or are you going to uh, throw a temper fit? Throw a tantrum? Or are you going to have God clean you? Because he will do that in the midst of that trouble, in the midst of that trial. He will speak a word to you. It says over there in Isaiah, I don't have this in my notes, but it says he'll speak a word from behind you. Even though you're in the midst of trouble or affliction, he'll say, this is the way, go there. He will do this. He has promised to do that. We're not going to miss it. Don't be afraid that you're going to miss God in the midst of trouble. If you seek Him, you will find Him. He will find you. He's got you already. He's got you in the palm of His hand. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. If anyone builds upon the foundation, whether it be with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, see, over well, there in Malachi, it said he refines the gold and the silver, but if it's wood, hay, and straw, it's going to get burned up. The work of each one will become plainly known for what it is, for the day will disclose it and declare it, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of each, the work each person has done. If the work which any person has built on the foundation survives, 
he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up, he will suffer the loss of it, but he himself will be saved, but only as one who has passed through the fire. Simply put, fire's coming. You ain't going to stop it. Donald Trump's not going to stop it. The body of Christ is not going to stop it. You can bind it. It's still coming. Okay? Hebrews, go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 25. See to it that you do not reject or refuse to listen and heed him who is speaking to you. For if the Israelites did not escape when they refused to listen to and heed him who warned and divinely instructed them here on earth, how much less shall we escape if we reject and turn our backs on Him who cautions and admonishes us from heaven? Then at Mount Sinai His voice shook the earth. But now He has given a promise. Yet once more I will shake and make tremble not only the earth but the heavens. Now this expression, yet once more, indicates the final removal and transformation of all that can be shaken, that is, within that which is created, in order that that which cannot be shaken may remain and continue. Let us, therefore, receiving a kingdom that is firm and stable and cannot be shaken, let us offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with modesty and pious care and godly fear and awe. For our God is indeed a consuming fire. I could just leave you there. And I think you've got the point. But, it's like I said last week, I don't want to frighten you, I want to enlighten you. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be saying, oh, it's going to get real bad, I better hang on. Okay, it is going to get real bad, and you better hang on. But I want to leave you with the assurance that if you hang on to God, He's going to get you through it. And, and the smell of smoke's not even going to be on you once you get on the other side. Go to, I, well, close with this. Go to Isaiah chapter 33. Verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The sinners in the world are not afraid. They're just partying like there's no tomorrow. See, to, to, to be in Zion means you're, you're in God's family. And if you're in God's family and there's sin, some deep oil in your fiber of your carpet, yeah, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be comfortable with that. That's a good thing. It's a good thing that you're not comfortable with something that God's not comfortable uh -huh. with. The sin okay, that's the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling seizes the godless ones. They cry, Well who among us can dwell with that burning fire? Who among us can dwell with those everlasting burnings? And God says, he who walks uprightly, who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises gain from fraud and oppression, 
who shakes his hand free from taking of bribes, who stops his ear from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes like turn the TV off. Such a man will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of the rocks. His bread will be given to him and water for him will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. Your eyes will behold a land of wide distances that stretch afar. Your mind will meditate on the terror, saying, Well, where is he who counted? Where is the weigher of tribute? Where is the World Economic Federation? Where is he who counted the towers? You will see no more the fierce and insolent people a people of a speech too deep and obscure to be comprehended, of a strange and stammering tongue you do not understand. Look upon Zion, the city of our feast and solemnities. Your eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tent that shall not be taken down, nor will one of its stakes ever be pulled up. Neither will any of its cords be broken. That's us. That promise in the Old Testament applies to us as God's people. As daughters of Zion. As the woman who flees to the wilderness. So Father... You've told us in many ways here through your word to listen for your voice. I thank you, Father, that you speak to us all the time. You speak to us in a still, small voice. But more than that, Father, I thank you that you have given us your word as a, as a billboard. As, as a broadcast on a wide screen that, that we can see everything that you want to show us, you can show us out of your word. That you have, you have showed us things by your spirit and you've showed your people things through visions and dreams and you do speak to your ministers and give them things to say. I trust, Father, that you've given me what I have had to say today. But teach each one of us <clears throat> to seek, above all else, to hear from you, to remain vitally united to you. And by doing that, we can be assured, we can be confident, and we can be at peace about the future that's coming this way like a freight train. Mm -hmm. And we give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.